Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Rainbow Talks. My name is Harry Hawkins. I'm the LGBTQ plus coordinator here virtually at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And uh, well, if you didn't know, there's a couple of things I'd love to bring you up to speed on. One, it's Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. We're coming to the end of it now, at least on the day that we're filming. And if you didn't know this as well, Black Lives Matter. Um, so with that, I would love to introduce our guest today, who is a friend of mine, and one thing as far as programming that we're doing a little bit different is that uh, Justin is not in St. Louis, but he lived in St. Louis, and that's when we met. So, you know, we changed up the programming just a little bit, but I think Justin, knowing him and knowing how awesome he is and the work that he does, I really wanted to have him on Rainbow Talks today to really just talk about this moment of what we're seeing, uh, and particularly how it's being much more recognized how Black people have been systemically oppressed in our society, but then also how does that relate into the LGBTQ community. So a little bit about Justin. Justin is a sociocultural anthropologist, performance studies scholar, activist, theater artist, and performance poet. In both their scholarly and artistic pursuits, Justin is concerned with notions of national and cultural memories, transgenerational traumas, Black grief, and Black and Black queer identity making. Their work seeks to understand how Black people might craft from that pain, grief, and trauma um, something that is breathtakingly beautiful, and from that beauty, freedom, and uh, liberation. Wright holds, or Justin holds, <laughs> an MA, that is a Master of Arts kids, in theater and performance studies from WashU, right here in St. Louis, or better known as Washington University, St. Louis, and is currently pursuing his PhD in anthropology at American University. Justin, thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. And then hello to your audience who I do not see. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we don't see them at all. Um, of course. We, we assume that they are there. Of course, mm -hmm. there's an audience of one or two, yes. I guess, however yes. you want to look at that. Um, so I think just to get things started in how 2020 is the, I guess you can look at it as the gift that keeps on giving in some aspect, or the gift you never wanted that keeps it's on like giving. It's like a Pandora's box as a it, gift. Yeah, you just it, wanna, just, hmm. it just keeps going. So how have you been holding up during this tumultuous time? Um, how has the pandemic really like changed your life personally and professionally? Yeah, so uh not been doing that great <laughs> like most of us i think um one of the I, of course i've been writing during this time as i'm wanting to kind of help keep me sane and together but one of the things i've written and kind of reiterated before i wrote it to a bunch of other people is that like it feels like we're holding ourselves together with scotch tape and spit you know just trying to like continue to keep going and moving on while everything is happening around you have the pandemic um that is you know decimating uh, a lot of our um, community in whatever community and as in a lot of uh, people in the U.S. but specifically um, it's hitting the black community um, it's hitting um, people who I know back home in Alabama and all these kind of things so that's already stressful having to move online for courses during that we should know I do not do well with online courses for class. I don't like it, they don't make sense to me. But having to deal with that, and then now with, um, of course, you know, the racial unrest and everything is not necessarily new, it's just it's become a lot more apparent. So having to be inundated with, um, you know, depictions and videos of more and more black people dying, more and more black queer people dying over and over again um, has been, frustrating but what's you know hopeful um is are the protests what's hopeful are um you know are people that are out there that are pushing forward for some kind of change uh pushing forward to kind of make our world at least better showing us showing people that yes hey we do matter our black lives do matter so it's been a little current of hope there but it is you know it's stressful it's a it's a rough time for everybody yeah, it's, it's been like every week it's been something new and something different and, and it's not necessarily been better. It seems like it's always no. worse. Um, and I can't imagine what July has in store. So, Right. I tell people it's like, uh, of course, and a lot of people say this is like a reality, like it's been like a reality TV show we've been on for the past four years. But it's every day there's something different. And if uh, um, like a fiction writer or a person who writes for a TV show, if they wrote 
all of the things that happened this year, like it would get returned back to them and say, this is not realistic. We can't put this on TV. Like we can't write this in a book. And it's like, no, this is our life now. So. Yeah, I don't even know to say TV why you could even do it. It's it's like mm-hmm. you couldn't do a, hmm. Yeah, it, you couldn't do syndication, which they don't have anymore. But uh, right. <laughs> people have no idea what's happening. Or maybe you could, because it's something new every day. So there's no serialization going on. I don't know. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so for folks who may not know you, I know some of these things, but I think it's important that people do. So, like, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Where were you raised? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, maybe at times you'll hear my accent pop out. It's been cold and changed over the course of all the places I've been. So when I get tired, you know, the deep south comes on right on out. But yeah, I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, um, you know, right in there. And it's, it's interesting, you know, being raised there, but then when you leave there and you tell people, oh yeah, I'm from Birmingham, all they say is, oh yeah, that has a lot of history. And it does. <laughs> it's, it's, it like, has a lot of like racial history and everywhere else. Uh, so yeah, born and raised there. Um, I am currently a PhD student um, in social cultural anthropology. Um, I got a master's in performance studies at uh, Wash U. Uh, I love the mixing performance and anthropology together. I study like the performance of everyday life um, in that kind of manner. Um, and I went to college in Ken- undergrad in Kentucky. So, you know, Bama to Kentucky to St. Louis and now to DC, so. Yeah, just making your way, make you know. Yeah. It's like I went west, but then I was like, ah, I don't like this and just dashed right on over to the east, so. I, you know, I, I think I would hope by now that at least four episodes and people are used to hearing a Southern accent, they have to hear mine. So I, I, yeah. I hope they know what's going on and <laughs> that, that they're used to, it. Like, whoa, what's All that right. moment um, that's happening. So thinking about like the LGBTQ community a little bit, uh, what were your first memories of the community? And if you're comfortable, like share any like experiences or stories that you had coming out. My first memories of the community. Oh, what was that? Um, what was that show that was on Logo with the Black queer folks? I Noah's Ark. Thank you, Noah's Ark. I don't know why I was about to say Daria. I don't know why <laughs> those two things. Daria is also great. <laughs> also Daria. Great MTV show. Yes. Very underrated. Was, you never watched yeah, it. It was it was Noah's Ark because um, I remembering it because um, we had. Uh, I forget which cable company it was, but like you could go in the guide and you could like watch Logo and no one's at home. So I'm of course watching Logo because me and my little gay heart. Um, and I'm, I'm watching that and, you know, feeling like, oh, I can, I'm seeing people who look like, like this makes sense for me, you know, being young like that, like I forget what, what age I was watching that, but looking at that and knowing like that made sense for me, but also feeling the kind of shame or feeling like you have to hide it too. Because, you know, I would watch it, but then I would, like, turn it off really quickly or, like, mess up the history on the thing and score a little way not to. Um, I think as far as, as th- that's early, like, a, a big moment that I can remember, at least a, a good moment, I think, that I can remember of that. Um, there, you know, there's a moment, too, and we're about to get a little, you know, <laughs> a little bit darker here, but there's also a moment um, I do remember, and it's not just key to the Deep South, but it is the Deep South. I remember being like maybe 11 or whatever in church. And I come from a um, non-denominational, but kind of Pentecostal like background in church. So it's the, the shouting and the speaking in tongues and the beautiful music and all that, right? But there was a visiting pastor that came uh, and I don't remember exactly what he was talking about. I think it was something about deviants or whatever, but I don't think gay people had any kind of place to go into this conversation. But all I remember from him is these homosexuals, they're raping our babies. And it's just like, what? <laughs> and, you know, I'm 11 or 12, you know, I'm just a child. And I'm just like, this is not true. This is one ridiculous. And also just like, like, how could you say something like this? So, I mean, that was a big moment that like turned me away from that religion in that kind of way too so those are earlier moments that i remember um you know the uh the the queerness and everything coming about as far as yeah yeah and you know i think folks who 
are not LGBTQ. And, and I think some of it learning that you, many LGBTQ queer kids who have grown up, unfortunately have heard a lot of these things, maybe not in church, or they've heard something also very derogatory and degrading of LGBTQ. Right. And I think it's like, at times, folks need to take a step back and realize like the weight that you're carrying and, and what you've grown up and heard about yourself mm -hmm. and how damaging that can be to your, your self-esteem. And, and also I think we've seen a little bit more now of some LGBTQ folks, you know, who are going back to the church. And, and at times I've heard some folks say like, are all LGBTQ people just not religious? And I'm like, no, you don't ever want to put a qualifier of all. That's kind right. of, it's, it's not, right. But I'm like, you have to understand that many of our denominations until recently, a contemporary thing said pretty bad stuff about LGBTQ people on Sundays. Yeah. There's a lot of hurt there and people are just apprehensive about yeah. it. With the acknowledgement that there are people who are in your church who are queer in some kind of way, right? Who, you know, there are people who exist within these communities, but you still say that and it's, yeah, it's really, Frustrating. And, and with it, there's just, there's a lot of work that, you know, a lot of us who hear it in our lives in general, but, and, you know, in my case, like hearing it in my life and also in church, there is work that like, we still have to undo every day. There are things that like, you know, I, I, <laughs> I remember um, maybe a year ago, I was like, okay, I'm fine now. Like everything is kind of good or whatever. And then I saw something and then I was brought right back to that point. I was like, oh, so we're not done with this. We're not done with these. Uh, traumas. It's something that I'm just going to have to continually deal with. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot of work. You got to keep undoing it because we we are, you know, acculturated in a homophobic and a misogynist society anyway. So it's like we, these are things that we have to continuously um, break down over and over again. So. Uh -huh. And as far, and this is an interesting segue into as far as breaking things down and systems and things that are in place, <laughs> is there racism in the LGBTQ community? <laughs> oh, Harry, I didn't know you were a comedian. Look at that. <laughs> but we're both laughing. Uh, uh, that's mm. not a thing. That's not a thing at all. How can a marginalized and oppressed community like the LGBTQ community be racist, Justin? No, of course crazy. not. The LGBT community, because it doesn't see color, you know, at all. So. For us, the rainbow flag is black and white, too, so it doesn't matter, but no. <laughs> I mean, uh, but on a, on a serious note, yes, uh, for all of you out there who think otherwise, there is a lot of racism in the LGBT community, whether it comes um, in, you know, the form of how we're understanding and conceiving of desire, but also like the spaces and the, the spaces that are held and the spaces that are predominantly white or um, predominantly privileged in some kind of way that aren't necessarily for us. Uh, so it's, it, it's there and it has always been. It's a, in any community, <laughs> there is going to be some aspect of racism because again, we have been acculturated into a society that is inherently racist as we see through. Um, television we see through um, music and all of these other kind of things so yeah it's it's definitely going to be in that community and it's a very difficult kind of uh in, it's difficult to go through especially if you're you know socialized male and you're you know you're gay um and the community is also not only racist in its in its ways but it's also deeply misogynistic so when you think of the lgbt community what most people think about is they think about gay men because they think about gay men being the head of the community then they think about gay white men and then on top of that cis gay white men and then cis gay white men who are somehow fit and more masculine in that kind of way right so yeah and you know you touched on a little bit about how it typically manifest like how how we do see racism and and how that comes up in the lgbtq community and recently i saw which you know facebook is just becoming one of those places that is harder and harder to get on but that's a whole nother <laughs> it's a whole nother rainbow talks. but um it's i saw someone that was positing a question um, and I think I'm giving it way too much credit, but you know, they were saying like, why is there black pride? Why do, why do we have that? And, and um, you know, there was a lot, there was a lot there. I was like, oh, mm, mm. so mm -hmm. 
Yeah. As if we wouldn't have our, our LGBTQ pride without Black people in the first place, but okay. Right. And I, I think that's it's something, especially with Pride Month going on right now, and it's a chance for us. Um, we really have two months. We have Pride Month and then we have LGBTQ History Month in October, but I think it's a time, right. especially with everything going on, to really look and reflect of like how this moment and this movement came to be. And right. Black trans women, um, Stonewall, that's yep. how this came to be and to acknowledge that that's, this whole movement is built on Black people. Yeah. And, right, and not only to acknowledge it, but to appreciate that fact while understanding that, you know, history has been not just unkind, but awful to Black people, specifically Black queer people and Black trans women like they've been in different ways attempted to be erased and all of these other kind of things. And you can see like, you know, it's, it's more now more than ever. Um, but so always, of course, you know, we have to appreciate this history while also holding the fact that there are still black trans women getting murdered all the time. Like we, we see that that still hate coming from within within the communities with like that hate comes at them because they're black, but also because they're trans because of all of these kind of things. So it's like, we have to hold these two things of the, you know, hold the appreciation for, for this history, but also with the knowledge that it's not changed as much for certain people, you know, that's, that, that's the levels of privilege within the community, right? You know, white gay men have it the best in the community. Cis white gay men have the best in the community um, because a lot of the, different laws and things like that and different rights have more often affected those particular groups because they have the most privilege in it. But we have to look at, you know, the long history of that and the long history of privilege here. And I think too, like something I've seen is there's, there's, um, and those of us who work in, you know, diversity spaces and, and do these conversations or really just try our best to educate people. I think sometimes you see like a defensive reflection, like, it's a reflex. Mm -hmm. Like when we start talking about this, it's, oh, you're attacking me. No, I'm not attacking you. Right. Um, if, it, if anything, society has been built for you to be safe. Um, mm -hmm. to begin with. So I'm like, I'm not attacking you. I'm actually just trying to raise these issues that you may not have known. Like you don't know because it was built around. Now some people do know, but right. right. some things were built around you and you were born into a system as that you didn't know is there. And I think it's like your job to really break these down and they're not right. Um, so but I mean, it's, it, yeah, and it's interesting, you know, and there's that Southern word interesting again too, yeah. right? But it's, it, what's interesting about the reaction to that is people feel like they're being attacked because they feel like their worldview is being attacked. So their response to like try to protect their worldview is to go on the offensive. Um, when, you know, the reality of the situation is that your worldview necessarily isn't being attacked, but it's being open and wide because yours is myopic, right? Yours is, is narrowed. Um, it's not including or inclusive of everyone um, and every, uh, everyone else's experience. But people react that way that, because they feel like if, if I have to contend with the fact that, um, you know, if I have to contend with white privilege, if I have to contend with, um, with male privilege, if I have to contend with privilege in general, it's like, oh, that breaks down my notions of who I, who I think I am myself. And it also like, in a way, like takes away that privilege, privilege from them. And people, you know, like their privilege. They like being in a specific space there, especially people who are already part of a marginalized community, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you can find some way to have privilege there, you know, you're wanting to hold on to that for dear life. Um, because at the end of the day, you like, you still aren't on the top of, you know, this, this spectrum of like who has power in this country. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sometimes I, I, I think I, I look at it and I say, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's an existential thing. I think when folks are being confronted with this, that your whole, to go off what you were saying, your whole worldview, your world is built on the oppression of other people. Yeah. Um, and specifically, if you're in the United States, Black people, um, mm -hmm. your whole worldview is built on that. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's probably an existential earth shattering moment. To yeah. like, like the gift says mind blown and be like, mm -hmm. uh -oh. 
Um, and, and, you know, take time and go sit with that and educate yourself and get good resources and learn how to be a better ally. I think right. it's just the one thing I've seen that I hope with more education, it's like we, people get away from the defensive reflex to say it's, it's a moment where people are finally saying they've had enough and this issue cannot continue to just be put off. Like we, we want to talk about it <laughs> and we've tried talking about it in the past and it didn't right. go. Now people are just upset and have every damn right to be upset right. um, about it. So one question I like to have for you is an artist who really takes these issues head on. Um, how have you been processing everything that's been going on and how have you been like creatively inspired during this time? Yeah. So I stopped writing for a while. Um, you know, the, we, we learned about the, I hate saying the pandemic hit. We learned about the pandemic, you know, in March and the stress and everything of that. It forced me to, you know, jot down a little bit of a little, few things in my journal because p- part of it's like the way I think often it's poetic because I've been doing it for so long and it's just like how my mind works. Like my notes for class are in some poetic kind of variation over that um, because I'm ridiculous, but that's okay. But like, you know, I, I stopped like, being able to put things together because it, it, it became so stressful. But the key in that I found, and it's a piece that I um, recently wrote that'll get recently published and so look out for that. But um, it's a piece that I found, um, I wanted to talk about, I found that I wanted to talk about um, the pandemic without having to talk about exactly what was happening now. So then I focused on, um, you know, my connection to the AIDS pandemic. Um, and I focused on my connection to um, a family member who who contracted HIV um, around you know around that time and who died when I was in college. So I started talking about that, you know, and I started writing about them, writing about the family member that you know um, that I necessarily wasn't necessarily close with, um, and why that was, you know, kind of breaking open. So why wasn't I close with them? Um, everyone in the family knew they were queer, right? Everyone knew that, but it was always hush hush. So it's interrogating that and interrogating, you know, that kind of, you know, the the quote unquote, the hush hush, right? And what that does to a person and then how it, and understanding what that did to, you know, that person in my family um, too. And, you know, so it's, for me, I was inspired to focus closer in um, because everything out was too loud, was too, glare and it was too kind of difficult to all process at once so i focused in and it brought me out to that where i realized oh i was i've been talking about i am talking about the pandemic currently but i'm just using this as a lens but it's also you know the same way that a vast majority of of black people you know were dying during uh during the the 80s and and early 90s um and, and continue to um be felt to that now it's similar to what's happening now every period you know we see this in when something uh like this is happening some kind of catastrophic uh incident or some kind of catastrophic um virus or something like this black people always take the brunt of it because to the state to you know the nation state to the u.s they are the most expendable you see it in um where uh you know black neighborhoods are often placed in cities. You see it um, where some uh, neighborhoods, low income black neighborhoods are placed on fault lines or, you know, placed in tornado alley or flood zones or different things like that. You know, it's even to that kind of like environmental kind of effect. So it's, uh, yeah, I I, I have pulled a lot past your question, but, you know, so I I basically started, you know, within um, and focus on that kind of my family. And then I got inspired to, continue to write and make more art about that. But it also part of it is if I don't write, um, you know, I'll just cry and then I'll stop crying and then it'll just be numb and empty and I don't like that feeling. So I have to kind of purge it all out. So, so a lot of it, sometimes it's exhaustion that is pushing me to write, but it's, you know, it, it, it has to come out at this point, I think. Uh-huh. And knowing a little bit about your work and, and some of the things that, that you've done and are very interested in, I know that you like studying like protests and protest movements. So like mm-hmm. with everything that's been going on, I think the past month, but have you had any creative inspiration or have you 
people has some things. Have the muses been talking to you during all of the protests that have been going on across the country? So yes, but in a very um, <laughs> in a very odd way. So oh. I'm now no longer putting a lot of focus in studying um, protests and nonviolent and direct action specifically. Um, not that it's not important, it's extremely important. It's just like I'm, I've been pushed away from it because I've gotten more to a, um, I hate the term radicalized, but I'm gonna say enlightened, more to an enlightened kind of way of, huh, should we just burn it down? <laughs> like I think, you know, I've been pushed more further into that. So I'm like, hmm, I need to take a step back from, you know, my, uh, what is it, the power of nonviolence books and all of these. I'm gonna just take a moment to kind of, and not not to say that you know I advocate violence or not, but it's um, it's a the rhetorical way that not violence is supposed to work. Uh, what's what I've been kind of inspired by though by watching and you know being a part of some protests and, um, that have been happening around DC and things like that in general too is the um, the audacity of the media to. In, in how they, um, the caucasity, I guess, but how they uh, pick and choose which things to focus on and when not to focus on it. So a protest that gets, you know, quote unquote violent, which often happens, um, and not just often, but always happens because the police enter, you know, and the police are then violent. Um, so protests that get violent that way, there's a huge focus on that, but there's no focus on, you know, the thousands of people that come and gather in the square that, you know, nothing pops off there like nothing there is no no violence or no violence against people i don't think that violence against buildings is the thing that's just that's a different conversation to have but you know so a lot of that has pushed me to kind of focus on the media which is largely what i've realized over the course of year being in a phd that i study um that i've kind of drawn to and it's always like the negative so i call it the negative mediatization of black people in the u.s which is the way the negative ways and just the ways in general that black people are are uh, characterized um shown seen in the media um and how that like has how a lot of that anti-blackness and racism had just like has infiltrated all of like our sources of media whether it's film um whether it's tv whether it's music um and like showing how that alters the way that black people are seen Mm -hmm. um you know even to a um it it, it, it it that can be applied to the extent of like it's it's seen as oh black people are um you know the the base oh black people are angry or this or that or um even like the weird idea that black people are somehow stronger or have some kind of superpower or something like that um the the officer who you know murdered uh michael brown uh he was saying i forget his name um but he was saying that oh it seemed like he had some kind of superhuman strength coming towards me and it's like no no he did like that's not at all what happened but you know you you've grown up in a society and where like the media has in its in its way like made that a thing in your head that even if it's untrue you're going to make yourself believe it for a reason but yeah you know, two things came to mind while you were saying that, and, the, and these are both within the last 24 hours. So it's it's interesting. We're talking about how the media portrays black people in general. Um, one, a media studies professor that I know shared this newspaper. So it was a front page of a, a newspaper down south. So to use our word, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> had the front spread and two crimes had happened in this town overnight one of them was a car was broken into i believe it was an suv an suv had been broken into at a convenience store the other one was they found a guy who had killed someone and had been hiding out in the woods for the whole for like a few days the car that had been broken into at the convenience store had this huge front page spread, had a zoom in shots on the windows broken and everything with the SUV. And then the guy who had murdered someone and had been hiding in the woods, because that's not scary, for the past few days had the, you know, the little tiny column. And of course, the big front page spread of who broke into the SUV was a black man. 
the guy who had killed someone and had hid out in the woods for three days was a white guy, had that little bitty column. And so, like, when you were just talking about that, that immediately came to me and I said, uh huh, I saw it yesterday. Yesterday. Yep. Yep. So that's, uh, that, that reminds me of the, um, when I was home uh, over the holidays, um, Christmas and New Year's in Alabama, I had seen on the news, and this just stuck with me because it just reiterated every single time this has happened to me and I've seen it, but I, I saw on the news, so there were these two parents, um, they were black, and they had uh, stolen uh, food for their baby, uh-huh. right? So they had, they had robbed a store, I guess, and you know needed food for their baby, so they, they took the food because they didn't have money for that, right? But that story was right next to a story, and this was on the news, like they were showing them and talking mm-hmm. about that at the same time. There's a, another story that of this white man who murdered his entire family. But the picture that they put up for the white man was a happy picture of a happy, loving family and them all right, together. Photo. Right, and the pictures they put up of uh, these two, uh, this black couple, um, were two mugshots instead of like the plethora of pictures that they could have had for like, oh, them and their love in the child, you know, their loving family too. But it's like, it's those like, those things that are conscious or unconscious and a mix of both all the time. That is just like, that, that's wild to me. But it's, you know, when you start breaking it down, you see it all across media where it's like, oh, you chose to put a mugshot instead of a picture of someone, you know, in a graduation cap or when they're just with their family or looking like this, right? You, you chose to make them seem more monstrous, to make them seem more criminal, violent, and that kind of stuff, so. Yeah, and it's, it's. I think for people who are maybe watching this episode, it, it's, it's, hopefully it's bringing some things to light, like these subtle things, I say subtle, uh, I use air quotes, subtle things that are done that you may not even realize around you that happen. And I think this is, this is one. My other story that I thought about is I was nerding out last night. And if you all have not seen it or ever watched it, I think one of the most awesome shows of the early nineties was Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Um, And if you don't know, the captain uh, was a black man and that's huge. That was huge for Star Trek and um, there was a lot of pushback. So this documentary that's now on YouTube, you can go watch the, it's kind of like a reunion because it's mm. going on 30 years since that sh- well, 20, excuse me. I, I need to watch my math, but we all know I don't math well, but 20 going on, no, it is 30 years. Oh man. Right. <laughs> 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 the first time, 30 years right. since Space Nine started and all of the pushback that, and the actor who played Captain Cisco is Avery Brooks and all of the pushback that Paramount CBS got for having Avery Brooks. It was just, I don't want to say it was amazing because it didn't surprise me some of the things I was hearing, but the part that did as far as the pushback they got was around how he was portrayed and Traditionally, Avery Brooks normally has a beard and he shaves his head bald. Mm-hmm. For the show, they made him shave the beard and have the full head of hair to mm. make him come across a little easier. And the director of the show who does the documentary, like I said, folks, go watch it. It's really good. He talked about how it took him three seasons to finally let Avery Brooks just show up on the set as himself with his shaved head and his beard. That is, what, what is the name of this documentary? It is, uh, oh, I'm just going to say, say look at that. Star Trek Deep Space Nine documentary. I cannot yeah. remember. I'm sorry, everybody, but um, look it up. It's just those, it's, once again, interesting how we talk about in the media, these things happen, and just right there on a character of a show um, that's really groundbreaking. I suggest everybody go watch that um, Star Trek that a lot of folks don't realize because there's a lot going on there um, that's very, very powerful uh, as well. One thing, uh, a question for you that I have, especially with the things we were talking about and when you were talking about like poetry and writing and how this period of time has just been so dark and painful for a lot of people in a variety of ways. How How does one craft something beautiful from a topic that brings so much pain okay yeah 
So I'll answer this in two ways. Um, one is the reason why I do it like that on purpose. Because yeah. um, I, I purposefully make things pretty and beautiful. Um, I'm obsessed with doing it because I think that it is much more um, impactful for me, you know, um, and to, pe- to, to some people. Um, it is much more impactful if something is like so pretty and slithers in and then you realize that it's rotting inside. So it's like, I, and, and I'll explain this. It's like, so if I'm talking about, um, if in a poem I'm detailing, you know, something gruesome, right? Um, I'm detailing something that has happened to um, some black person um, or a queer person or whatnot. There's a way that, you know, while still keeping the, the spirit uh, and honoring who they are as a human being um, and writing that and writing their lives or writing, you know, about a death or something like that, that you make it beautiful. You make it look like a, um, like a, be- I explained it as like a, um, a beautiful watercolor painting, but in, you know, in writing, right? You make it look like that. So people, so they immediately touch and they're like, oh, this is so pretty. And then they realize what it's about. And then it's like, oh, this isn't as pretty as I thought. It's like you pick up a lovely flower, but then you realize the flower is poisonous and could kill you. So you put it, you're like, oh, yikes. I didn't know that was what was underneath. So it's a very, it's an interesting strategy that I employ and have always employed um, like that because it, it makes people, specifically white people, uh, (laughs) uncomfortable when they're reading because they're like, oh, your words are so beautiful or it's so eloquent. And I'm like, yeah, they are. Now look what I'm saying, right? And look at what I'm saying and, and I want you to hear it and I want you to see it. Um, the other part of that is I think, and it's not just, um, you know, taking like things that are like gruesome, like events, right? But I think it's very important for me to make, you know, cause when I'm writing, I'm always writing from a perspective that is black and that is queer, right? So it's very important for me to make those things beautiful, even the pain and things that we go through to craft something beautiful out of that because it's something that I think that we deserve. We don't have access to that. You don't see that all the time, right? And it's, you know, it's it's poetry and it's fictionalized in some kind of way, but it's, um, it, I don't know, it's just something that's important to me to for me to craft like you know a beautiful uh i think in very visual terms so you'll get all this what it's like to craft a beautiful sculpture out of words or things like that you know to to wind something uh around like that okay so here's a very (laughs) here's a very interesting um i think an easier way to explain i was talking to somebody last night about this actually um so there's a um we're gonna go to a little going to teach you a little bit about Greek mythology here anyway. But so Narcissus um, in Greek mythology, um, Narcissus flower, you know, narcissistic, all that kind of stuff. Basically, the, the general story is, oh, he, uh, you know, made a god angry or something. And then he was cursed to fall in love with himself and only himself. No one else is there. So, um, you know, he, he dies because he Airs into the water. Right, <laughs> falls into the water, whatever. But with Narcissus specifically, there is um, more so than most other figures that are supposed to be coded as male um, in Greek mythology. Like others are pretty, but Narcissus is always talked about as being pretty and like beautiful in this kind of like elegiac kind of way. Um, so then his death then is always pretty. It's always him you know, wary waif like falling into the water and then like mm-hmm. bleeding into the watercolor and then turning into the da- the dandelion that he becomes, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like that. It's taking something that um I have my own thoughts about narcissism and I don't think of it that way. I think of narcissism as a as a black boy who was trying to um who was trying to love himself. Um Whoa. you know it's like reframing is that is a very interesting thing, right? Instead of oh, somebody that. narcissistic like as someone who is trying desperately to learn how to love themselves, they have to call, they have to look at themselves and call out, you know, hey, you are beautiful, you are this, I love you. Um, But a world that's not conducive to that doesn't like that. So then, you know, unfortunately that character then dies or whatnot. But uh, yeah, so it's like, that's, I think that's a, maybe it's a useful kind of visual example of like, you take something like that and it just becomes beautiful in the gruesomeness of it. 
And there's something too, I was in earlier about with the human condition and what we do is like, sometimes when there are things that we're faced with, like your words of like talking about something that's real and happened and you're bringing it to their attention. Sometimes people have this way of glossing over and mm -hmm. focusing on the beauty of it. And they're like, Oh, and I'm like, yep, that's what our minds do sometimes. Right. Almost goes back to that defensive reflection type thing of mm -hmm. like, oh, this is beautiful, but, but what's really, you know, being said and going on there. Right. Yeah. It's how um, people, you know, they'll focus on, so say you have a black person or a core person or somebody, right, who, um, in all other accounts, uh, this other person who, uh, they may be white, they may be, you know, uh, a heterosexual person, but they did not, in their mind, they did not expect that person to be eloquent or whatever, right? So if they hear something, they hear a speech, they're like, oh yeah, they're so eloquent, or they're so this, but it's like, yeah, you're, you're landing on that, but what did they say? You know, like it's, 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 it's that still deflection thing. It's like, oh, because part of it is I didn't expect this to be so eloquent, but it's also like, that's what they're grasping on. It's like, oh, your words are so beautiful. And it's like, oh, I loved, I loved hearing you, but, it's like, but you didn't listen to me. Um, so what I try to do with the poetry is I try to bypass that, that kind of focus where it's like an earworm, it sticks with you. Um, and you know, it, sometimes I think it works and sometimes it doesn't. And if ever I feel like something is too, like the, the pretty or the beauty of something is too, is clouding like the actual meaning, I'm you know, changing it immediately. But you know, like that, that's the point. And I think it's trying to bypass the, just the focus on the pretty. And even if they focus on the pretty for the, excuse me, the first time that they read it, I, I want something to stick in the back, you know, to, just to sit back there so that, you know, they may look at it again or a couple of days later, they're like, oh, that made me very, very uncomfortable. This mm. was, but that doesn't actually sit well, you know. Hearing that a lot lately too, people say I'm, I'm uncomfortable with some of this. It's like, yeah. Good. <laughs> Correct. You know, when you're uncomfortable, that's the growth zone. That's where mm -hmm. things happen. Um, and if you're right. uncomfortable with this, imagine people who have grown their entire life with this. Um, right. People who don't know what comfort looks like. Correct. At least in the way that you're explaining it, right? It's, oh, so you're now getting a modicum, a very small bit of like, just the, the discomfort that, you know, people like us live through every day and have to live. What did you say? 400 years of this. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well. yeah, so what, we talked, touched on this a little bit earlier, like mm -hmm. these issues have been around 400 years, um, and what is, what's different this time? I've heard people, and you were talking about the hope a little bit, and I've heard people who yeah. seen this, especially 2015 here in St. Louis, and, and now we're in this moment. What is different this time? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. And uh, just to kind of, for you and the audience, hope is a very, it's a concept that I don't know how much I like because people's connotations of hope are overly optimistic and not realistic. Mm -hmm. ultimately. So I don't think of hope, I don't think of it as hope. I think of it as the dream, but for the purpose of this, I will use hope. But I think, honestly, I think what's different might be the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, that it's affecting everyone. I think that that's the, the thing because that's one of the few things that's like completely different. You know, I don't know if people would be forced to get, you know, to, so, so wait, let me backtrack a bit. I think it's a pandemic, which forces everyone inside, right? So now we're inundated with media because it's all we deal with all day, even more so than, than normal, right? And now these things are happening. We're finding out months later that something happened in February, something happened in March. Um, a black person was murdered here, a black person was murdered there, another black trans person was murdered here, another uh, black trans person was murdered there. And you're getting it flooded in a way that you can't necessarily run away from. You can't you know, go to a bar and shake it off. You can't do that. Uh, or the majority of us can't do that. You know, Some states are still open enough and then whatever. But um, you can't get away from it. And I think that what's happening is that it seems like it's upsetting. Um, so I think people crave 
stability. I think people crave the um, status quo, right? When I think of the status quo, I think of like that form of stability. The pandemic has upended that form of stability. Um, and I think that because a lot of people are um, looking at this and being confronted with it and they can't shut it off really, like they pop up on Twitter and it's gonna come up, it's trending, it's doing this, right? They're forced to reckon with it. And then maybe some people are jumping on the, you know, of, of course, I think there are a lot of allies in, in any sense, you know, there are allies to the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community, allies to the black community, um, to the community, communities of color. Um, and I think that there are a lot of allies who mean well and who are out there, you know, doing good work and whatnot. But I think some people, you know, just kind of jump on the bandwagon of, okay, this is cool right now, this is useful. Um, and then maybe by doing that, they're changing things, but they're making their friends also do the same thing, right? When you see your friends doing it, you think it's a lot easier for you to now. So maybe, you know, you didn't protest when Mike Brown was shot. You didn't protest when Trayvon Martin was, uh, was killed. Um, you didn't protest uh, when Sandra Bland was murdered. Like you didn't go out there in Baltimore. You didn't go out there in Ferguson. But this time you feel like, oh, I think I can now because I see other people who are doing this. And I think it's part of like, it's part of the pandemic. It's forcing people in. I also think that the, the children on TikTok are doing some work. Gen, uh, Gen Z, y'all have been sleeping on Generation Z. Look, I, I get to teach them every fall and you're sleeping on them, folks. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how TikTok works, but they're okay. somehow like crafting these like, uh, because everything's you know forced to be virtual and every and things like that they're one a lot of these kids are just extremely talented with the way they craft this stuff but you know they're crafting these things and, and making them not necessarily palatable but um maybe that's the word i don't think it's the right word but i use that but making them palatable to their audience which is an audience of like so many people but it's a nice little video that they're putting in and they're like okay here is uh a bunch of reasons why this thing right here is racist and sending it to you or hey this is what happened this is messed up and it goes viral so i think that you know we're at a very interesting time and i think a lot of factors have come into play technology being forced to for everything being forced to be virtual the feeling that people can't necessarily get away the feeling of upset the feeling that people's stability is coming at a point that's pushing us into what i think is a window of possibility right now right it, it seems like for for one of the first times people are are not only are hearing us but are actually listening and different things are happening um so and that's where the hope comes in with the window of possibility it's like i think i i feel like there's there's something there and not to mention you know the the um cluster that has been <laughs> the trump presidency and administration of the past four years coming to a head too so I think a lot of things are boiling over. So we just got to see how it shakes out, really. What would you say to folks right now who may be frozen? And I've seen that too. Like people are like, I know this is wrong. I've got to do something, but I don't know what to do. So like, what advice would you give to folks that want to speak out and advocate against systemic racism in our country? Uh, yeah. Okay. So question then which folks are we talking about right um and i and i think you know to both it's like okay to it's a relevant question yeah right so like to to black people right who are feeling this um and for whatever reasons the reasons they feel frozen like the reasons black people might be feeling frozen and saying let's, let's just say white people like yeah what? yeah okay. i think to um to to white people people I've, I've encountered this in the past few weeks people think oh i'm being mean and i'm not necessarily a i'm not the nicest of people but i think that um when it's a literally google right it's there are resources that are everywhere and what you have to go do is you have to go look and you know and when i mean google i don't mean actually just google you can do that but it's like there are different things on on all over instagram people are making very beautiful like little graphics that are doing that kind of work and making that you know a palatable thing for people to put on the stories and things like that there um i've been getting from different friends and from different people who are out there who are organizing i've been getting sent a lot of materials that are um you know easily packaged in the digital format that tell you okay hey these are the things that need that 
you need to kind of donate things to, or these are like different um, ways you can call, you know, someone in government, or you can do this, or these are different ways to help out. And it's like a lot of the lists are there. What you have to do is um, you have to find a way that works for you, because obviously being out on the ground is not for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. The way a movement works is that you have multiple parts of a movement. Right. You, like, you can't have everybody just out being, you know, um, a very necessary foot soldier in, in the protest, right? You can't have everybody doing that. You need people who are organizers in the same way you need with advocacy. You need people who are out there on the ground, you know, sometimes being a shield for uh, people of color against the police in that kind of way. Sometimes using your privilege to do that. Uh, you need people who are talking to their followings of, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people um, who kind of taking their content all the time you need those people kind of doing that kind of work there so you just have to figure out what is useful and what's good and what works for you in a way that doesn't not necessarily that doesn't make you uncomfortable I think you should always be uncomfortable but in a way that like you know maybe you are a person that has deep anxiety and being out in a crowd full of like thousands of people is deeply upsetting to like the chemical balance of yourself you know maybe also, we're in a pandemic i mean some people can't yeah we're also in a pandemic and you know there's a lot of like fear that's going on around there and some of us are um immunocompromised in a way right so it's like just finding a way that is safe um you know in that kind of way for you to do so and you know there are a lot of resources on twitter on instagram all over social media all you have to do is really look for them because they're there and then those things will often connect you to something else, which will connect you to something else. And then you'll be like, oh, wow, this is a whole new world that I didn't know about. <laughs> the resources are out there. And I, and I always say there's room for people in a movement. A movement is always growing. There, there mm -hmm. is, if you want in, there is a way that you can be helpful in contributing. But staying silent and not doing anything and continuing to let the status quo happen is not going to make things better. Right. It's, Gonna make things worse. So, Justin, to the black queer student who may be watching this, who wants to grow up and be you one day, oh. what advice would you give them? Do not be me. <laughs> but uh, they want to do the same things. You yes, do. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sent sentiment understood. Just, uh, <laughs> I, I mean. You know, I, I think about this a lot, right? Because it's like, what would I have said to my younger self if there was yeah. someone who was, you know, who was a me to them, who was in kind of a position of that? And I think of like what I say to, you know, kind of the younger people that I mentor, the younger black core people and that. And it's one, you have to honor both um, your successes and your struggle, right? Like you can't, um, you can't just pack, you can't, live a um, meaningful life and have packed away a lot, all of your struggle and all of your pain and things like in a little box um, that you don't want to like deal with or recognize anymore. Obviously when you're at a point and you can deal with it, do so. But I think you have to honor that struggle. You have to honor the person that you have become as a result of that. And maybe there aren't, you know, some of those things or some of those characteristics you picked up because of that aren't great, but you need to honor that and pay attention to that. But also, honoring your successes. One of the, one of the things that I say to um, a lot of people uh, and what happens is a lot of like queer kids and a lot of black um, queer kids specifically, they have an issue with accepting praise. They have an issue with knowing that they did well. It's always like coming down on yourself or you wasn't good enough for this or you didn't do this. And it's like, oh no, take those moments of like, um, those moments where you feel like you're being, you know, narcissistic, <laughs> narcissist back there and take that, like you own that. You are amazing in this. Like you look great through all of these kind of things. So I think that part of it is like learning to honor all of the things you've been through, but while having to affirm yourself. And I think um, also just trust the fact that this sounds so cliche. Trust the fact that you're going to be on a journey and life is earning. Everything is constantly changing, right? Like, like you transitioning into the person who you are supposed to, you know, and I'm obviously pulling that kind of, uh, that kind of connotative notion from that, but like becoming the person who you are supposed to be um, and you feel that feels right by you is a constant process, right? I am realizing things in the past like month <laughs> about myself and about who I am and my own like 
identity and like my own queerness even more so than I thought before. And that's opened up wider worlds into understanding my own work and, you know, all of this other kind of stuff too. So it's, it's a process that you have to kind of push through and that you have to, when you can find that community around you to help bolster you um, in that. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> I think it's helpful. I, mm -hmm. I thought it was very helpful. It's right now, especially, I think a lot of us are at home. There's a lot of time to think. It's a, it's a really existential time. I think that's my word for this whole period. It's, it's a time to really think inward and to look at things that may be working and are not working. Um, yeah. and it's time to change that. So, Justin, it, we are at the end of the interview. And of course, this is when I throw a curveball, lightning. Uh -oh question random oh. question i love doing this so okay i have a random question for you um what is the most overrated stage play or musical in your opinion most overrated just pff, people get way too into it oh the phantom of the opera i hate <laughs> i hate it hate it hate it here, okay here here is a hot take and I'll tell you, here we go. Do not attack me for this. You can. I don't care. It's my opinion. I am not here for rock musicals, really. Like, I'm not here for that kind of thing. I don't... The interest of rock... Eh, anyway, but that particular musical is not good. It's not good. And it's just... It's annoying. And it's something that has been stuck in my head for years since the first time I heard it. Um, you know, the, the Phantom of the Opera song. da 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 Like, it's just there. And it's so... In my head right uh, now, thanks. <laughs> good, now you feel where I am. So yes, The Phantom of the Opera, it's trash. Um, we will just say masquerade and leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that. Now that one's there, so... You're welcome, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Justin Wright is a socio-cultural anthropologist, performance studies scholar, activist, theater uh, artist, and performance poet, currently pursuing his PhD at American University in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Justin, for joining us. Thank and you for having me. Everyone watching at home, know that stay safe right now and know that you are loved. And we will see you next time on another episode of Rainbow Talks. Have a good day.